perseverance allows me to love the Lord my God with everything that I am. Yes, sir. To put him first and not anything else. Amen? Right. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. He's saying, get dressed in tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. live in a time today when everything is all about division and as a nation we're just torn apart and songwriter said we we all believe the same yes, sir. really the only thing that's going to bring us together is love amen that's the only thing that's going to bring us together our message today is one that begins our, our our new sermon series for the month of March, where uh, Pastor Williams and Pastor Norval and myself will be uh, preaching on the theme of building each other up. Yes, sir. Building each other up, and as each of those songs uh, reminded us, there's a need to build each other up as opposed to tearing each other down. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we uh, read as our uh, opening scripture uh, the first 12 verses of Romans uh, chapter 14. And I just want you to uh, keep your finger there. Remember uh, those verses. And we're simply going to continue our reading at the 13th verse. And I'll read uh, seven verses through the 19th verse. Again, Romans chapter 14, verses 13 through 19. Paul says, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Amen, somebody. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or a sister. He says, I am convinced being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives at the same time human approval. The 19th verse let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Right. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for every blessing that you have so generously bestowed upon each of us. I stand now, Lord, to share your word with your people. Bless me now, Lord. Strengthen me, Lord. Guide me. So the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart are acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we're uh, starting a new sermon series today where we want to uh, concentrate on building up one another. Amen. Uh, we, we, we can sometimes inadvertently do things to cause our brothers and, my, and our sisters, uh, you know, to not be uh, encouraging. Uh, sometimes we can say the right thing, but with the wrong tone. Uh, the message might be correct, but, but, but how we share it, uh, you, you might have a little edge to it. Amen. Uh, sometimes things may not occur as we had planned or as uh, we would like them to. Uh, you know, for example, 
uh, uh, last week, uh, Sister Frances Phillips lost her husband. And the homegoing celebration was on Wednesday. And for some reason, our church condolence did not get to the funeral home. The funeral home said they did not receive it. And as you can imagine, uh, Sister Phillips was hurt because it gives the intention that her church family doesn't care about her. And, and my personal apology to her is that I'm sorry that we did not make sure to happen what should have happened, amen? And we're gonna do our best to make sure that those things never happen in the future, amen? But the, the, the truth of the matter is things occur in our lives, in our church families where we don't encourage as we would like to. Sometimes we don't do that intentionally. Uh, I, I think most of you, if I have your email, you received uh, an article that I sent out last week. It was from uh, Mary Southlert, I believe is her name, Southland. Uh, and the title of the article was Five Ways to Lovingly Deal with Difficult People. Uh, and and she, she began the article, and I kind of summarize it, by saying that the, the, love, the, the, the world that we live in today is one where we experience a lot of problems. Amen? Uh, and as a matter of fact, one problem after another. We simply, they just come to us. Amen? And uh, she said that uh, she's discovered that the biggest problem of all is people. <laughs> And, and, and you know, she, she went on and she said, I'm sure it, she was you know, making this statement in humor that if there were fewer people, we'd have fewer problems. <laughs> now, you know, when you get over the, the, the humor that I'm sure she intended, uh, I, I think we would all agree that some people are just more difficult to get along with than others. You know, they, they can rub us the wrong way. I think in the article, uh, she even referred to them as sandpaper people. <laughs> And she said, you know, we try to change those people. We, we, you know, we try to fix them, fix them. We might run from them and ignore them. Uh, but the point of her article was that in order to get along with some people, especially the sandpaper people, you have to take a new point of view. We have to see those people and all people as God sees them. Amen. And I believe that if we see those people as God does, we will make a choice. And the choice that we're going to make is that we're going to choose to love them. Jesus, when asked what is the greatest of all the laws and all the commandments, he said it's pretty simple. Love God first and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Uh, so, so, so I want to point out that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul reminds us that as believers, as Christians, we're all part of one body, the same body, the, the, the body of Christ. Uh, and, and each of us, if we're the same in the same body, we have to understand that we need each other. I need you, you need me, amen, that we belong to each other. It would make no sense for me to simply ignore what's going on with my arm. Amen? If my arm is hurting, I'd better take care of it. Otherwise, it won't be able to serve me. Before long, I'll be walking around, I'll just be dragging my arm. Or, or same thing with a foot. If, if I have a headache, if I don't deal with the headache, it's going to cause me problems. So Paul is saying that we have to care about parts of our body. Amen? So, uh, when we go to our text, this 14th chapter of Romans, Paul reports that something is going on in the church body. He says the church body there is being fractured. It's, it's being divided. It's being divided because of the criticism that's going back and forth between the Jews and the Gentiles. The, the, the Jews are saying, well, you know, you really ought to uh, 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 abide by you need to continue to follow uh, the, our traditional Sabbath and, and the Gentiles wanted to celebrate the first day of the week because of Jesus' resurrection and the, then the Jews were saying well there are certain things you shouldn't eat and the Gentiles were saying well no no, no I should be able to eat anything and, and, and Paul is saying that 
It's not about that stuff. Uh, he, he says, you know, you, you don't, don't get wrapped around the axle, as I like to say, about the minor things in life. Don't, don't, don't get upset about the minor differences in opinion uh, that, 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 that you might have. And in verse four, 13, he says in our text, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Amen. Now, the, you know, the reality, the truth is that when you bring a group of people together, there are going to be some good times, some bad times, some, some ups, some downs. You're going to have some successes, some, some failures, disagreements, and even some conflict. Not just in our personal relationships, but right here in the church. And I think the truth of the matter is that it, it's, unfortunately, sometimes too easy to judge and to see our relationships get broken up over just a difference of opinion. Well, maybe we should be reading the New King James Bible. No, you have to read the, the ESV. Oh, no, it's the NIV. Uh, uh. Well, you know, the choir is not singing the right songs. Oh, you know what? I, I like it when the order of worship went on this long and when you did this and you had that and then you did this or, or I don't think you're wearing the right clothes to church or, uh, you, 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 know, you, you got a tattoo you can't come here you got an earring in your eyebrow or your nose or your Paul is saying look you guys need to that doesn't matter about what the church is all about you can't build anybody up if your focus is on the small stuff the minor stuff he would call them trivial issues. He, Paul said, hey, we, we all got one issue, and that's sin. And we all have one need, and that's salvation. He said, that's what you really ought to be concerned about. Don't be so quick to get mad and to fall out with your brothers and your sisters when they're not acting, talking, looking like you want them to. Our goal for the church should be the same goal as the one that Christ had. Take a look at John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, the Father, are in me and I in you that they also may, may be one in us. That the world, he's talking to the Father, the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is saying, it's all about us being one. You can't be on one accord. You can't have a harmonious, loving atmosphere. God will not get the glory. We will not be able to bring individuals to know and love and follow Christ if we're fighting with each other. Amen. When a church really offers love to each other and to those who are welcome into the church, whether it's in the sanctuary or in your transformation groups, I believe we'd have to lock the doors and keep the people out. And that, that, that's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. That's the kind of church that I believe will transform people everywhere, Reverend. <laughs> well, let, let, let's return to our text. We see uh, in Romans 14 that Paul is giving us several elements, several recommendations that will help us to build a growing, loving church and which will unleash the power of a loving church. Now, first of all, I'm, I'm going to go down to the last verse in my text. He writes in the 19th verse, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for what? Peace. And the things which what? May edify one another. I added the word one another in there. He says it's not just, it's not enough to just accept or tolerate the people who are different. It's not enough just to accept or tolerate those who have different preferences. He says, we need to pursue, to actively concentrate on, and to do those things that lead to harmony 
and unity. Because he knows that it is those things which will allow the church to grow. And when the church grows, disciples are being made. Disciples are maturing. And God is getting the glory. Well, what are the things that we might find in this text and in some other scriptures? First and foremost, I believe that to have a loving, growing church, as our focus is, we must commit ourselves to building up one another. That has to be a commitment. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. The writer says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. He said, you ought to think about that. You need to consider how you can spur one another on. When you, when you, uh, I think he uses the word spur because he understands that a, a horseback rider has on his feet spurs. And the purpose of the spur is to do what? Add a little motivation to the to the horse, to, to get the horse to, to run, a, run a little faster, to run a little harder, to try to get towards its goal. So if we are going to spur, not just ourselves, but if we're going to spur one another towards love and good deeds, that means that we are doing it with a sense of urgency. I, I can't take my time to show my love to you, my brothers and my sisters. I, 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 can't I, I can't just take a lackadaisical attitude about how I want to try to build each other up. It's got to be top of mind. Right after loving God and glorifying God and praising God, I got to start looking at my brothers and my sisters. What is it that I can do today to make somebody's life a little bit better? Amen? How can I encourage one another? Well, truth of the matter is, we all know that life is difficult. As a matter of fact, it gets pretty tough sometimes. We lose loved ones. Folks say the wrong thing. Folks don't do, folks don't follow through. And under those difficult times, when we're under a lot of stress and pressure, sometimes people don't do the right thing. They may not intend to do the wrong thing, but instead of encouraging, they discourage. Amen? So, I, I was just imagining, as I was putting this, this, script, uh, this message together, just what would the world look like if in our families, our, our communities, uh, on the job, in the school, even in our churches, if our primary focus was to make everybody feel better, to do our, do our best to help them to feel better. What, what if I were to say, and I wrote some things down, what if I were to say from this day forward, I'm going to make one of my primary goals to build up to encourage those around me. Uh, from this day forward, what, what if instead of criticizing those I don't agree with, I'm going to pray for them and encourage them. What if instead of turning my head when somebody that I don't like or who stepped on my toes, when they come my way, instead of turning my head, I'm going to go out of my way to show them God's love and to encourage them, to try to make their day just a little brighter. What if instead of using sarcasm, and other forms of sharp humor. I speak a word of encouragement. You know, we, we, we can cut with sarcasm. I, uh, I heard someone make a comment when someone said that they were going on vacation. They, they were saying this on the job. And this person said to them, you going on vacation? You on vacation even when you're at work. And, and, and then they kind of add it, just joking. Yeah, right. <laughs> sarcasm, sarcasm, it cuts to the quick, amen? And I want you to know that I'm a firm believer that the power of the church is unleashed when we commit ourselves to building each other up, amen? Now, second of all, I believe that in order to unleash the power of a loving church, we have to recognize the value in everybody. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 10 tells us to love one another with brotherly affection. And then I really like this. It says, outdo one another in showing honor. Now, honor is an interesting word because when you honor a person, you lift them up, you, you, you inspire them, you, 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 you encourage them. You show them through word and action that you care about them and that they are important to you. That's communicating through word and deed that you value the person. So the next time you find yourself getting upset with somebody, remind yourself that if you're not sure where you can value everybody, Remind yourself that Christ died for that person. Amen. You know, they, they might be obnoxious, and I know some obnoxious people. They might be immature. I know some of those, too. Right. Definitely know some disagreeable people. But Christ died for them. Yes, they might be the last person in your T group to volunteer. They might be late getting on the Zoom call. Yes, and when they get on, they might expect to be in charge. But let me remind you. <laughs> Christ still died for him. <laughs> Amen, somebody? <laughs> we should ask ourselves, do I have, little old me, the right to judge, to criticize, to turn my nose up at the people that Christ died for? No, no, no. The fact that Christ died for them, that tells me, and I hope it tells you, how much value God and how much value Jesus Christ placed on their lives. So, in order to unleash the power of a loving church, we have to recognize the value of and in everybody. Here's the third ingredient. Uh, Pastor, I only have four. I don't have. <laughs> I did, but I cut it down. Here's the third ingredient. In order to build a loving, growing church, we have to keep our focus on what's really important. I've kind of alluded to that already, but if we go to the 16th verse of our text, Paul writes, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. I believe that Paul is saying to us that if we focus on the things that are eternal you can put up with a lot of external faults and mistakes that people might make amen, amen. And, and, and you know when you when, when you think about being focused uh, I, I really enjoy watching magicians perform magic tricks and, and one of the things I, I, I'm a horrible magician the only thing I can do is take my thumb off uh, But, but one of the interesting tools that a magician uh, has in his or, or her tool bag uh, is distraction, right? You know, that, that they'll have a, a magic wand and they'll, and they'll, or, or a, a little, what do you call it, a little big napkin, handkerchief, thank you, sir, uh, uh, something. So, so they'll have you looking at this while, while they're getting the coin out of their pocket. They really depend on their ability to change your focus, uh, to get you to... Uh, to not pay attention to what's going on over here so they can do something over there. I, I, I know another master of distraction. Uh, his initials are S-A-T-A-N. Uh, some people call him the D-E-V-I-L. But, but he, he is a master of distraction. He, he's a master of using some small things to seduce us, to entice us, to distract us. And he even will use those small things to distract the entire church. Because he doesn't want you to see things clearly. Uh, he wants you to see what's going on over here. Uh, he doesn't really want you to focus on the mission of the church because he knows that if a church doesn't have a mission, it can't carry out the Great Commission. Now let me say that again. If a church doesn't have a mission, it can't carry out the Great Commission. So, if you're going to be a loving church, if you're going to unleash the power of the church, 
you got to keep your focus. You can't get distracted by that small stuff. Amen? And a lot of small stuff goes on in the world, and one of the major purveyors of it is Satan. Finally, my brothers and my sisters, we build a loving church by having the right attitude. Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 says, Therefore, if any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, instead, on the other hand, in humility, value others above yourselves. Amen. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Amen. He's saying, it's not about you, it's about everybody else. Seems like everything just kind of points back today to the fact that Jesus said, love God and love your neighbors as yourself. He wants you to see the best in everybody else. He doesn't want you to be distracted by the small stuff, the mistakes, the stumbles that, that we all will make. Uh, I, I'm reminded of, a, of an artist who, who, who he, he liked to go to the park in the morning and and he had a habit of taking his easel and his uh, drawing pencils or his paints uh, and he would look around at the people who walked by or who sat on the other park benches uh, and, and he would you know draw them and uh, one morning as he was uh, looking on the other side uh, of the pathway there was another park bench and on the park bench sat a homeless man and as you can imagine, the homeless man, first of all, had all of his earthly belongings in a grocery cart. Uh, clothing, you know, he's, he's not going to the laundromat regularly. Uh, so they were a little dirty, and, and, and he's, he's not going to take a shower. So he was a little dingy. He was a little uh, unkempt. But, but, but the artist saw something in the homeless man. And, and the artist began to, to sketch, to fill in the outlines of the sketch and, and, and after a little while he believed that he had finished the sketch uh, he, he stepped back and he looked at the picture and he was pleased with what he saw uh, he, he called the homeless man over he said I, I, I just finished a drawing take a look at it the homeless man looked at the sketch and he said is that me the artist said yes that's how I see you. I want you to know, my brothers and my sisters, if we're going to unleash, unleash the power of God's love in this church, in our T groups, we have to see each other as God sees us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Not how we look on the outside. I want you to know, I want you to know, that we need to ask ourselves some questions when we are with our brothers and my sisters. You need to first of all ask yourself, what are you looking for in your brothers and your sisters? What are you trying to see? When we have first time guests to walk in, what are we gonna see in them? What are we gonna focus on? There are going to be times when some members who've not been in the church in two, three years, not just two or three months, they decide to come back to the church. What are we going to see in them? What are we going to say in our minds about time? What you've been doing? Or are we going to see that God has touched their hearts and has encouraged them to come back? What are you, what are you going to see when somebody disagrees with you on Facebook. Uh, it, it, is it time for you to get up on Facebook on your soapbox and tell them how wrong they are? Is that what you're going to see? How about if somebody's of a different color, different political party? It ain't about all of that stuff. 
Paul said you got to keep your focus. Don't get distracted. Make sure that you are dealing with the right things. Again, I'm going to return to the 19th verse of our text. He says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. In other words, as far as it depends on you, live, live in peace with everybody. My brothers and my sisters, I'm about to take my seat, but I know that when we act with one heart, one mouth, we give God all the glory, and we unleash the power of a loving church. Paul said in the third chapter, fourth chapter of Ephesians, verses one through three, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Now we all claiming that We've been called to redemption. We've been called and we've been forgiven. Calling is just about those of us who claim to be ministers of the gospel because we've been called. All of us have been called to repentance. And Paul is saying, you need to live a life worthy of that call. You need to live a life worthy of the one that you are following. You're saying that you're following Jesus Christ. You're claiming to be one of his then Paul says, if that's the case, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Again, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Amen. I believe that he's telling us that because when we're divided, it's just a sad testimony to the world. When the church is falling out with each other, when the church can't get along, when the church is on the news, <laughs> that simply causes somebody to say, well, you know, I, I told you that they weren't no good out of That's why I'm not wasting my time over there. But I want you to know that when the church is together, I like when it says how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together. In unity. That's the kind of church that, that, that I want to be a part of. Amen. That, that's the kind of big church as well as little church uh, that I want to be a part of. Not a perfect church because there isn't one because there's no perfect Christian and we're all Christians. But I want to be a church that's growing in love, in joy, in peace, in forgiveness, in perseverance. All of those things that the Holy Spirit will bring about in our individual lives, we refer to them as the fruit of the Spirit. Because I believe that when we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way, we will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Because I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitted every groan. As long as I live, I'm going to hasten to his throne. So my brothers and my sisters, uh, hopefully you will also want to be a part of a church where love is the ruling authority yes, sir. in our dealings with each other. Yes, sir. I think we should really strive to be a church where we definitely follow the great commandment. Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and our strength, and with our mind, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And we should do that because the scripture tells us that God is love. Amen. And uh, I believe that love is seeking the best for everybody else. Amen. Uh, I, I was uh, listening to a sermon by uh, Pastor Tony Evans uh, a week or so ago, and, and, and he was talking about something that I found re really interesting, uh, and it really fits in with this portion of this message, he said that uh, if you hang out in a flower shop, before long you start smelling like flowers. Yes, sir. <laughs> he, he said, if you happen to hang out in a department store in the perfume or the cologne section, uh -huh. you'll start smelling like what? cologne or uh, perfume. Now, he, he said that if you're not smelling like love, well, if love is not what's emanating out of your pores, he said, maybe you hang it out in the wrong shop. Well, he said, maybe you need to go to the love shop. Yeah. 
and stop hanging out at the other guy's shop. Uh, 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 and I'm so glad that I know where that shop is. <laughs> I, I, I know that the door is always open to that love shop. Uh, I, I know that Jesus opened the doors wide open when God gave the command. He said, I, I, I love y'all so much, I'm going to send my only begotten son. And if you simply open the doors through your belief in him, you're going to smell just like me. Uh, you're going to be just like me. You're going to be filled with love. Uh, everybody who's around you is going to smell that love. They're going to get that love on them. Uh, and, and all together, we're going to be able to encourage encourage one another. So as I prepare to take my seat, I just want to encourage you to love each other. Encourage each other. Build up each other. It don't cost you nothing to say a nice word about anybody. It doesn't even cost you a dime to say I'm sorry. It, it doesn't cost you a nickel to simply let something go through one ear and out the other. I'm here to tell you that God knows everything. <laughs> God will take care of you. Uh, he'll fight your battles for you. Uh, he'll make things right when you know that they're wrong. Uh, it's not up to us. It's up to him. Uh, all you got to do is put it in his hands. You just do your part. Show God's love just like he showed it to us. I I'm so glad that Jesus Christ decided that he was going to show his love for us. I'm so glad that God didn't give his son just to be a bartender at a wedding, to be a, a, a caterer for, for a church potluck dinner. Uh, he, he didn't give his son just to form a club, a gang. Uh, you know, you know, uh, he didn't give his son just to perform miracles, to heal the sick, or even to raise the dead. He gave his son to fix our fractured relationship with God the Father. That's why he gave his son. He gave his son to be hung up for our hangups, as some preachers say. He gave his son to pay the price for your sins and mine. He gave his son to defeat death and conquer the grave. He gave his son to die so we might have eternal life. Uh, and die he did. Didn't he die? I, I want you to know they, they nailed him to an old rugged cross uh, and he hung on that cross from the sixth hour to the, you know when it was. Uh, and, and so many things happened. They, they say that the earth rocked and reeled. Uh, that the dead got up out of their graves and walked. Uh, they say that the veil in the temple was rent or it split from one side to the other, which says that you and I we can go to God ourselves. We don't need a priest. I, I want you to know that so many things happened on that day and he did die. Did he die? Oh yes he died. They hung him on that rock, rugged cross. They put him in a borrowed tomb. But he got up. Ooh, he got up. Uh, all power in his holy, in his righteous hands. He got up. Able to touch your life with the thing of love. He got up. Able to straighten out all of your stresses and your mess ups. He got up with the power to do everything but fail. I'm so glad I know him. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know who he is? Do you know what he did for you? Do you know what he can do for you? Do you know what he will do for any and everybody? I'm here to tell you that he will. Make your path straight. That's right. He'll make your path straight all the way to heaven. Because yeah. he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by him. Right. And if you don't know him, ooh, we're going to extend an invitation right now to get to know him. Amen. It's as easy as ABC. All you have to do is understand that you are a sinner. Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short. The Bible also tells us that the wages of sin is death. Ooh, but I'm so glad there's a thing called grace and mercy. Woo! I should be going to eternal death and damnation. But God had a little mercy on me and extended some grace. 
The grace was his son Jesus who died for me. And all God says is confess that you know who he is why he died and what he can do for you. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart who he is and what he has done, is doing, will do, the Bible says, thou shall, not thou might, thou shall, not a maybe, thou shall, not that you need to do anything, but Confess it with your mouth and believe in your heart. Yeah. Thou shall be saved. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So if you don't know whether you're saved or not, let me remind you. It's as easy as ABC. Yes, it's real easy. Jesus did the hard work. He did the heavy lifting. He went to Calvary's cross and died for our sin. We don't have to do that. Yes, but it's really crazy sometimes we just keep fighting battles we don't have to fight. We keep suffering, suffering when we don't have to. Amen. And Jesus said, hey, look, I'm a burden bearer. Amen. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Hook up with me. Amen. And that's what we're encouraging you to do right now. Hook up with Jesus. Yes, Turn your life over to him. He says you need to deny yourself. Forget about what you want. Yes, Forget about what you think is best. Forget about what you think is the right way to deal with your brothers and your sisters. Amen. He says... Follow me. I don't know about you, but I have decided to follow Jesus. Anybody else in here decided to follow him? Praise the Lord. Minister Baltimore is standing by the phones. If anyone is in this sanctuary or if anyone is on YouTube or Facebook and you want to talk with the preacher about how to make Jesus your choice or if you need prayer, now it's a good time. God has blessed us with however many years you've been alive. He's blessed you with almost 12 hours on this day. But I'm here to tell you the 13 hours not promise. The next year of your life is not promise. So I don't know about you, but I would encourage you to get ready. And, and, and while I say that, don't act like crazy folks who say, I have to get well before I go to the doctor. Uh, I, I, I need to lose some weight. I, you know, I, I have a physical coming up. <laughs> and, I, and I got on the scale. I didn't like what I saw. And I know the doctor is going to. But it would be crazy of me to say, well, I'm going to put that off. I'm going to work hard to lose some weight so that when I go to the doctor's office, when I have that examination, when I listen to what he needs to tell me to get my physical life right. Yes, sir. Yes. Ooh, isn't that crazy? How many times did we do the same thing with the Lord? Well, well. When I get spiritual, you cannot spiritually heal yourself. You cannot fix yourself spiritually. You cannot correct your relationship with the Lord. Only if you Lord, I need you in my life as Lord and Savior. So today we encourage you Ooh, make Jesus your choice. Amen. That's a great choice. Amen. Ooh, I'm so glad I finally made that choice. I made a whole lot of other choices in my life. Amen. And they didn't all turn out right. As a matter of fact, very few of them turned out right. <laughs> Ooh, but when I made Jesus my choice, I've learned to deal with the hardships. I've had somebody walking with me through the valleys. They've helped me over the mountains. And those times may not have been easy, but I knew that I was not walking alone. Amen. You'll never walk alone Amen. if Jesus is your choice. Amen. One songwriter said, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> if I could sing, I'd sing it to you. <laughs> but I want you to know that Jesus is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. When you don't have nobody else, you do have Jesus. So again, if you've not made him your choice, do so right now. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that all of those who are listening to this message, either in the sanctuary or on YouTube, Facebook, that Lord, your Holy Spirit will bless, will convict, 
will spur them on if they have never made Jesus their choice to do so right now. And Lord, for those who have made you their choice, then we're all in this category, Lord. What I'm about to say, Lord, is true for all of us. Help us to be the loving brothers and sisters who build up one another. Help us to live and laugh and encourage one another as you would have us to do so, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We lift up your holy name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen and thank God again. For returning to his Father in heaven, Jesus commissioned his followers to go and make disciples. Becoming a disciple begins with a confession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is step one. Step two is to join a local church such as Mount Moriah and continues with a lifetime of growth in faith and fruitfulness. Call one of our pastors or connection counselors today to join this journey of discipleship. We experience the power of prayer daily at Mount Moriah. Also, our pastors post a prayer on our YouTube and Facebook pages each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. We are also commanded to study God's Word because it teaches us what is true, corrects us when we are wrong, and teaches us to do what is right. The continuation of this church's ministry would not be possible without your prayers and your financial support. Thank you so much for your generosity. Remember to view and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook channels there as well as on our church website www.mountmariahomaha.net you will find sermons, pastoral prayers, and more information to help you know us and to know the Lord. Finally, we thank you for worshiping with us today and pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, that the Lord will turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.